Here we are, we few, we happy few, right? At the, at the, 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 the last panel for uh, the 2018 Global Force Symposium and Exhibition. But the, and best, what a, but the best panel. Sir. Well, well there, there you go. By, by decree of the Sergeant Major of the Army, the best panel, right? <laughs> it's, which is why he chose to, to be on it. You know, we've, we've heard a lot over the past couple of days about, about requirements, about capabilities, about speed, about platforms. I think one of the things that rings true with, with all of us who have had the privilege of serving with or, or uh, alongside the United States Army is the Army's premier weapons platform is the individual soldier. So we're very, I think it's appropriate that we conclude the 2018 Global Force Symposium and Exhibition with a focus on soldier and the soldier lethality. Um, th this uh, panel is chaired by the, or, or the uh, senior mentor, is General Steve Townsend, the Commanding General of the United States Army Training and Doctrine Command, and moderated by uh, Brigadier General Retired Pete Palmer, uh, um, well, well known to all of us that, that uh, have been involved in this business. So General Townsend, General Palmer, SMA, and the, for the whole panel, thank you for, for uh, bringing us home and bringing us home strong. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our final panel for th this symposium. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I'd like to do, uh, first of all, an honor to, to do a soldier's panel, being an infantryman. So uh, I'd like to introduce our, our distinguished panel. First of all, we have General Townsend, the TRADOC commander. We have uh, Brigadier General Donahue, the commandant of the infantry school. We have Major General Gervais, who's the uh, deputy commander at uh, CAC and CAC-T. And uh, Mr. Uh, Rego from the Night Vision Lab and Mr. Hawk, from uh, his uh, Hawk Association, but also will give us a, a congressional uh, aspect of uh, this panel. So, sir? Uh, I, for, excuse me, Sergeant Major. <laughs> All right, what's the trick? Mess that one up. <laughs> Good morning. All right, you're weak. Good morning. All right, that's, little, that's kind of a sparse crowd out there, probably because you know, we're not only the last panel of the day, we're the last panel of the conference. General Ham, uh, thanks for that, but I, I know you're saving the best for last, as you said. Uh, General Palmer, thanks for the uh, introduction and thanks for your service to our Army and our nation at TRADOC and continuing service here with uh, AUSA. Uh, we've, we've got a challenging assignment here today uh, to get through this, but I, I'm really looking forward to your questions. Uh, please you know, grab the guys with the white cards walking around and uh, submit a question for us because we're really looking forward to taking on your questions here. The bottom line up front for this panel is that U.S. close combat soldiers and Marines and our squads and platoons do not overmatch our opponents. Our adversaries have access to weapons and technology that, that have enabled them to close the gap with our forces night vision devices, weapons and munitions, and improved body armor are just a few examples of where they have closed the gap. I would argue that other than night vision, we've really mostly relied on physical fitness, superior training, and combined arms to prevail in the close fight for the last number of years. I would say in the final 100 yards, uh, that edge is inadequate. Can you bring up the first slide? So we only have two slides and they just got pictures of soldiers on them. So in this slide here, you'll see there soldiers uh, of today in the center. You'll see a prototypical Vietnam era trooper there on the left and on the right soldiers from the 1990s. Well, you, the big takeaway here is other than a few accessories, what we equip our U.S. soldiers with today has really not changed much in several decades. Some changes to body armor has improved, laser aiming sights and uh, weapons accessories, night vision devices have all improved, minus our new pistol that's coming out. We haven't done much for these guys here. So that's really the charter uh, for this CFT. Uh, there are approximately 100,000 dismounted soldiers, infantry, cavalry, 
engineers, medics, and the FOs that accompany them, soldiers who close with and destroy the enemy in close combat. They must have the capabilities that increase their lethality, mobility, and survivability. And they got to have room to counter emerging threats in the future. The soldier CFT, the soldier lethality CFT, has that task to provide overmatch to what we call the close combat 100,000. The Secretary of Defense has also established a close combat task force. Now, this is a parallel effort, nests really well. Our effort nests, I'm not sure who nests with who, but uh, it's a really good effort from OSD to have this kind of focus from our Secretary of Defense on soldier and small unit lethality uh, while that, that will support the efforts of this cross-functional team. Our soldiers require not only the best equipment we can give them, but also the best we can provide them in training. This has really been our real, as I said earlier, this has been our real edge over the last several years. For over 30 years, we've had pretty good simulators for aircraft, for vehicle, tank gunnery, etc. cetera. Uh, we've not ever really broken the code beyond uh, the engagement skills trainer. We haven't really broken the code on that for dismounted infantry, the close combat 100,000. Our current trainers are antiquated, they're fixed, and they lack the architecture to rapidly up upgrade. To quote uh, General Scales, why do we invest millions in training a fighter pilot, but not in training the infantry troops whose lives are at much greater risk? It probably has something to do with the fact that pilot is flying a multi-million dollar jet I would imagine, but still, his point's well taken. The synthetic training environment, our leader for that is Major General Gervais to my right, is the beginning of this effort. We've got to develop the virtual and constructive training environments that allow our squads and teams and soldiers to get multiple reps at low cost and wherever they are. Before I turn it over to the CFT leads here and our subject matter experts, I'll close out with uh, three final points. First, we have to close the current gaps within our own service that our soldiers have with the enemy. That these gaps that impact our close combat 100,000. Second, we've got to stay on task. Can you bring up the next slide? So we just did a little research. This is a slide from 2003. My predecessor, a couple removed, sat in front of a group like this in 2003 and talked about this very same topic. So since 1990, there have been no fewer than three efforts that were undertaken by our Army, a lot like this one, using almost exactly the same language, soldier as a system, ground combat soldier system, something similar to that. And they use the same language we're using today. To, the goal was to achieve decisive overmatch at the soldier and small unit level. And they even talked about training, too, how we had to improve training to increase sets and reps. Here's my point. Fifteen years from now, I hope my successor is not sitting here showing you another version of this slide or another <coughs> version of my slide talking about the importance of this topic and why we haven't got it right yet. Go back to the other slide, please. My final point is, it's our soldiers who set us apart from our adversaries. We owe them the equipment and training that matches their courage and determination and overmatches our enemies. I'll now turn it, pass the mic over to Brigadier General Donahue. I think you're hot. All right, I think I'm good. All right. Thanks, sir. So General Townsend just outlined very well where, where we're at right now, but more importantly, uh, we have to produce to make sure that we don't fall victim to what has happened. And I would tell you, we've actually went back and studied several of these efforts to make sure that we are not going down that same line. Um, so the first thing is from a soldier lethality, th this is the broadest one that we have out there of all the CFTs, it, and to use the, as the chief described it, that shoot, move, communicate, protect, sustain, human performance training and simulation. So very broad compared to the other ones. 
So we've defined soldier lethality as uh, lethality, mobility, protection, situational awareness, and training. However, one key factor of that, and every time I see General Murray, I'm very quickly re reminded, cost is also an extremely important thing. It has to be affordable, and we have to be able to get this stuff out to people very quickly. So our guiding principles, obviously we want to put the right capabilities into our soldiers so they can fight, win, and survive now and tomorrow. So to make sure we do not go down that same road, the guiding principles that we've developed, the first one is, is and you've heard this before, we want to treat the soldier and the squad as a platform. We're going to talk to that with the last uh, bullet that I'm going to highlight on our principles. The other thing is it has to be scalable. We want to make sure that we're focused on initially the 100,000 who close with the enemy. That's a CAV scout, that's a platoon medic, that's an FO, that's also the infantry. But that way we know that it will be affordable and then we make a decision as an army later on of what else we put out there. We've collaborated with everybody out there, SOF, so, um, SOCOM, specifically the headquarters, their subordinate headquarters, and the Marine Corps and the Air Force. Why does that matter? Because we want to make sure that we're developing stuff together and also that we're bringing everything together from a scale perspective. And down at Fort Benning, we got together and reviewed all of our programs across all of those things to make sure we're doing that. User evaluation and touch points. We're already doing that. Anything that we develop, soldiers will have multiple touches before we actually purchase it, whenever in that prototyping. And that's occurring with one of our program, well, actually two of our programs right now. Um, we want to develop capabilities at the speed of war. We know that we are on a short timeline for this, especially how the soldiers have been, from a financial perspective, it's gone over the years. And we will make sure that there's growth built into everything we're doing. I can't say enough about the Close Combat Lethality Task Force, the Secretary of Defense of Mr. Joe Latois, the director's doing, they're helping us out considerably, especially with funding. And then we've developed a lethality analysis team that evaluates exactly what we should be putting into the squad. Um, so out of all that, um, our initial CFT capabilities that we're going after, the first one is the replacement to the saw. We're calling that the next generation weapon systems. So the first program is to replace the saw. The next one is to replace the M4 carbine. Uh, our current systems work very well. That is because we are going after an existing threat that is out there uh, that we know presently uh, we're challenged to defeat. Uh, and then enhanced night vision goggle. Uh, that is dual tube fusion so that we can fight day and night and we're now putting uh, the capability to see whether that's reticles, sights, everything else into the dismounted soldier. So think heads up display version 1.0. And then linked in with uh, General Gervais, uh, our next program that we're looking at and we're already starting with industry and prototyping is heads up display 3.0. And that's the key because that will be the end user device that will allow us to train, rehearse, and fight with the same weapon systems, not two separate things. That saves money and we makes that training much more realistic. And then the adaptive soldier architecture. We started this from day one back in November, and the current PEO soldier at that time, Major General Cummings, and now Brigadier General Potts, have uh, bought into this and formed a team. Anything we put into that squad, it has to be able to make sure that it is adaptive. I'll give you one example. Any nod that we buy right now, that mount comes from that industry. Whatever, whoever makes it, they have a specific mount that they use. Now, anytime you uh, buy a nod, it has to come in with the government-specified nod mount. That'll save money, a tremendous amount, uh, to the tune of about $45 million a year. Tactical power. Uh, we know that the demand on power is going up, but actually what we can do with current existing power, that's a flat line. We have to consolidate and drive power use down while we're trying to figure out other alternative powers, but we all know that's pretty difficult. And then the last one is, and General uh, Townsend hit this very well, training. So we're also looking at extending initially uh, OSIT extension for our infantry forces. We will start that pilot in July. And um, so you can see very broad portfolio and how we're intertwined with all the other CFTs that are out there. And uh, that's our initial ones. There's a number of ones uh, below the line, counter defilade, uh, soldier signature reduction, reducing the weight, that's part of that soldier architecture that's extremely important. If something comes in at the current weight, we'll probably refuse it. It has to actually come in lower. Um, and then uh, medium range recon level UAS and close combat task force is helping us out with that. So I'll turn it over to General Gervais. That's a very quick overview of where we are. 
Good morning. Can you hear me? Good. Hey, so although I've been the C uh, CFT director for about 175 days, I've actually been the DCG for CAC-T for about 18 months. And so my team and I have been actually working on the synthetic training environment since that time frame. So I appreciate the opportunity to come talk to you about STE CFT efforts and also the Army's future training environment. And, you know, I'm pretty excited um, as I sit here because of the progress that we can make under the, the uh, direction of the CFT, but more importantly, where I see technology going and where we could be in about three years. So if um, General Townsend kind of alluded to it, but if you look at our current training environment, I mean, our virtual simulators, they have served us well over the time. They have met the requirement for what they were built for. However, we're gonna try and leverage the unprecedented technological advancements that are being made in the $5.2 billion virtual and gaming industry. And we're gonna go um, with that to provide leap ahead tech, uh, technology simulation capabilities to not just the squad, but also to our other uh, air and ground simulators. Our efforts um, are focused on providing units the ability to conduct hundreds of simulated reps before they have to do it live. We're looking to uh, break the current paradigm of indi individually developed systems with legacy technology requiring the development of systems unique terrain formats. We're looking to move away from our antiquated hardware um, intensive systems which are locked into our mission training complexes which require high resource personnel resources to run and also have long lead times for preparation of an exercise. So the Army's future training environment, we require the latest technologies that must be built on an open architecture in order to evolve so that as we see the advancements with technology, we are able to utilize those advancements in technology much easier than we can do today. And it also has to be available to commanders or soldiers wherever they need to train. They shouldn't have to schedule a mission training complex. They shouldn't have to wait in line. When a commander or a leader needs to train his soldiers, he needs to have the tools available. We're also looking for common data, common standards, common terrain, and also for more software-centric versus hardware-centric uh, solutions. So as you take a look at it, our approach, and I changed our approach when I came in because our approach was very linear, and we were gonna deliver the synthetic training environment in about 2025, 2030. So my biggest fear was that we were gonna give the Army an iPhone 1 when we should have been on an iPhone 10. So we've changed that, that process, and we're very user-centric. We're gonna leverage the virtual um, and gaming industry. And right now, we're finding promising technologies. We're experimenting with it. We're conducting technology demonstrations. We're seeing what works, what doesn't work. And we're gonna figure out what is in the realm of the possible and refine our requirements in the process. And our timeline is very aggressive because we're pursuing multiple lines of effort um, as we go forward. And I would just like to give uh, highlight a few of those. So our near-term efforts and, and progress to date includes, and the first one I consider it our Achilles heel, and that is terrain. We have difficulty providing commanders the terrain that they need to prepare their soldiers when they have to fight. So we have an effort that's called One World Terrain that's gonna provide a capability that provides a fully accessible representation of the globe and is, on, and is the same terrain in our virtual, our gaming, our constructive, and live, and we can even put it in our mission command information systems. Right now we have 57 different terrain formats, which makes it very difficult. We envision going down from 57 down to one. We also need this terrain to replicate the environment that they must, our soldiers must fight in, and that includes EW, cyberspace, and megacities. And we must ensure that the megacities or dense urban terrain actually represents the patterns of life. So we are working on that, and I look forward to your questions. We're also looking to replace our current legacy virtual simulators. We had an industry day in September 17, we actually completed our very first user assessment last week. We had seven vendors on site. We had from across ForceCom from the National Guard and also from across our centers of excellence. We had master gunners, we had Bradley crew members, we had pilots, 
and our technical experts that were all sitting there with those seven vendors and telling them what's right, what's not right. And as we told them that, we provided them the, the feedback. We're going to bring them back in 60 days, take a look at it. We're going to refine the process, and then that we will actually have a operational test where we will put it in a leader's hand with his soldiers so that they can look at, um, tell us what's wrong with it. And we're looking forward to doing that in um, the September time frame. We're also looking at common simulation software so that we can have the engine that needs to um, be able to go all the way from the individual, the squad, all the way up to our larger scale exercises in constructive. And then the last effort, I'm working very closely with General Donahue as he mentioned. It is the squad, the soldier, the vir virtual trainer, and we lack a squad semi-immersive immersive training capability to fulfill the SECDEF and the uh, CSA's identified critical gap in close combat training. So I've been working very closely with the soldier lethality team and the close combat lethality task force. We had an industry day in February. The user assessment is this summer. And we have seen some very promising technology and we're going to experiment, te do technology demos, and we're gonna put it in the hands of the soldiers so they can tell us what's wrong with it. So I'm gonna close and I'm gonna tell just this quick little story about one week after I'd been in the job. I got to go to the Pentagon and I got to tell them all about all the knowledge I had in my head on the synthetic training environment, which was very little. But he was sitting next to me, Sergeant Major of the Army Daily, and he just leaned over to me and he said, ma'am, I just gotta tell you, if you'd put this widget, and I, it'll remain nameless, he said, if you'd just put it in the hands of NCOs and soldiers, we would have told you it didn't meet the need. So Sergeant Major, I've kept that with me and I've changed the entire process. Over to you. <laughs> it's on. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, oh yeah, it does work. Didn't have the green light on, I'm sorry. I'm just programmed as a soldier. You know, it's gotta have an indication that something works. Hey, I just wanna thank everybody here because you are the diehard recipients of the AUSA Conference Medal. <laughs> Every one of you are here on the last panel on the last day, and I thought I was gonna be talking to uh, the TRADOC commanders um, aid and my uh, enlisted assistance. So thank you for being here and supporting us. Um, so I just want to reiterate one point that is critical here um, that the trade commander mentioned up front. And that's another PowerPoint slide. It looks just like the one we had before. But I can tell you this is not just another slide deck. This is not another brief to a leadership or to the, the community that supports us, the great industry out there. The leadership um, of the institution, the Secretary of the Army, the Chief of Staff of the Army, they're committed to this. So much so that uh, you heard the Secretary of the Army announce that he's going to create a new command. A new com command dedicated to getting after some of the capability gaps that we've known existed for some time. Some of that has been limited by resources, some by time, um, and some by the current fight and our capabilities. But I think it's proof at this time that this slide shouldn't be, hopefully, and sir, not the same slide that your predecessor or the next two or three people put up there. Um, but we're getting after this. And I can tell you from an enlisted perspective and now the view of the SAR made of the Army, um, I can tell you at the senior leadership, they're very serious about this. And we got the right people, um, some of the best people on this team, um, committed to the right cross-functional teams to get after some of our capability gaps. So when we, when we think CFTs and uh, we talk to the industry, we tend to talk about the material solutions. And I, I'm gonna make some comments on some of those, but I wanna talk about some of the non-material solutions that we're getting after to increase soldier lethality. Because um, at heart, I'm a soldier. And when we talk about the future of the Army, that discussion should start um, with the United States Army soldier and how we make them more lethal and maintain their capability in this increasingly complex environment of the future. Well, you know, when I woke up this morning, I said, what are the first thing I wanted to tell the, the, the audience of the panel today? And I realized what it was. The toughest thing I do every day for the last 30 years is PT. It was a lot tougher this morning because the guy I was running with is half my age, but it's tough. And we have to revolutionize the way we train physical fitness because we can have the greatest equipment in the world, but if we don't have a force that's capable to fight and win in any environment and have overmatch of our enemy in physical capability, and we'll, we'll be limited to our uh, technological advancements. So we have to continue to do that. And we're working that very hard. The Forcecom, Force along with TRADOC, has been working side by side, closely knitted together, to present the Chief and the Secretary with physical fitness um, test solutions for the future, to make sure that we are providing enough uh, rigor and relevance to our physical fitness programs 
to ensure that our soldiers are meeting the complex demands of each one of the environments they operate in. The second one is policy. We have to change the way we've been doing business. And that starts with uh, things like you saw the Secretary of Defense just release and announce that uh, we have to take a hard look at non-deployable soldiers. And uh, the key to that is not the 12 months, but non-deployable for any reason. We're here to fight and win. That's what soldiers get paid to do. They get paid to fight and win. And every soldier on the team needs to be part of the team that's going to get on the way bus, because we don't intend to play home games anytime soon. The last is how we utilize them. So we got to look at where we put our soldiers throughout the formation. And we got to stack the importance. What's most important in the fight right now? Well, obviously, we have an enduring fight throughout the globe, assuring and deterring, um, as well as TRADOC commanders got a big mission of trying to build the Army and bring in the 80,000 soldiers we need to meet and strength requirements. Um, so we're having uh, very, and which I'm happy to hear, we're having great discussions at the most senior levels about what to do with staff sergeants. These seem like very small issues, but they are strategic in nature when you start talking about what the priority needs to be. Everything is the priority. We assume risk everywhere in the Army every day, um, but they have to be done in a sequencing effort so they mutually support each other. Um, we can't simply man everything to 100 percent. Some material, material um, comments that I said that I would talk about. We've got to make sure that we be careful as commanders and SAR majors out there in the field is that we don't want for everything. I call this the ACOG effect. Back when the ACOG came out, it was superior to any site that we had previously. And of course, they're expensive. And once the, the shooters, I call them, got those in the hand, the 100,000 that the trade out commander talked about, everybody else had to have them. And when I was walking around uh, Iraq, I realized that uh, we didn't need them. Many of those expensive uh, devices were sitting in the corners in FOBs. And uh, we don't have the resources necessary to give every single soldier the best piece of equipment, the greatest technological advantments possible. And frankly, is not every single soldier is going to need that equipment. We've got to man the force appropriately. If you haven't been to a CIF lately, you should go. <coughs> soldiers need pickup trucks to get their stuff. And that's good. We, get, we bring them great capability and options. All right. But we can overburden a soldier with capability, uh, and we need the man to force appropriately to meet the requirements of the soldiers who need it, but also sustain our resources. Time. Um, it's the unbuyable resource. Uh, we gotta, we got to change the way we train, and we know that. We, and we've been doing that effectively. We have uh, effectively changed the way we train for the last uh, um, 18 to 24 months, getting back to high-intensity conflict and revolutionizing what we do at our, our CTCs. Um, but we've got to maximize on that time using the live, virtual, and constructive means that General Gervais talked about. But when we use those virtual and constructive means, they need to reinforce the basic tasks, not degrade them. Soldiers need to be using their weapon system, their sites, along in the virtual and constructive environment. Um, we've got a lot of those platforms out there that bring great capability, but simultaneously they degrade basic skills. It's the conversation we have all the time, is that we've got to maintain and sustain basic skills, and those virtual environments must do that. From the simple things like trigger squeeze, sight picture, and aim, they have to be constantly reinforcing those virtual environments. And that's the tough part, integrating virtual capability with maintaining basic skills. We've got to drop the weight on our, our, on our equipment. And we know that. We've been talking about this for years. And we're doing an effective job at doing that today. But that comes in two forms. Um, we have to assume risk for our subordinate leaders. Just because we give it to you doesn't mean you have to wear it all on the battlefield. You take a look at that picture there on the one on that's my left. I think you're looking at your left, too, as well. There's capability in being maneuverable. There's capability in being light. There's also vulnerability within that, too. And that vulnerability is not consistent every day on the battlefield. And we have to trust commanders to make those risk decisions. It can't be every time a soldier gets hit on the battlefield that we do an investigation of whether or not you are wearing this piece of kit. There's too much kit for our soldiers to wear every day. And they need to have that kit to have options on the battlefield as well as commanders. But we've got to trust their risk decisions and make sure that they're using appropriately in order to maximize our soldiers' capability. Um, I would say I yield the remaining of my time uh, to the gentleman to my right, but I've already exceeded it. And I look forward to your questions. And uh, thank you for being here. Oh, thank you, Sergeant Major. I'm, um, I'm Don Rago. I'm uh, the director of the RDECOM CERDEC Night Vision Electronic Sensors Directorate. This is my 31st year working in Army Science and Technology, and I've had the pleasure of uh, experiencing all of, those, uh, all of those soldiers that General Townsend showed. So I, I want to take a few minutes of my time to talk about the role that science and technology can play to support soldier lethality 
uh, touch a little bit on how we can work with industry to accelerate technology as a soldier in an affordable way. Uh, you know, we absolutely support the Army's vision. You know, technology needs to be a part, just a part, but an important part, providing overwhelming lethality to, this, to the soldier at the small unit level. Within RDCOM, uh, we have a number of laboratories uh, that work everything for the soldier from clothing to sustainment, weapons, training, sensors, communications, power, armor. Uh, this group of labs has always supported the soldier, so you know, it's exciting, but, but in some ways not that new. Uh, you know, in my case, night vision case, uh, you know, General Townsend and uh, General Donahue alluded to this, uh, there's been tremendous improvements in night fighting advantage that's come from successive generations of image intensifiers and thermal sensors uh, through science and technology, fielding of the PM, the PEO. We've improved capability, we've re reduced costs and weight. And you know, we're still going to work with industry uh, to expect future improvements in this area. Uh, we expect to go further, but we have to make some fundamental changes in the way we approach technology for the future. You know, in the future, we see that technology, uh, science technology has to help the Army maintain uh, overmatch in complex environments and contested spaces, you know, small spaces that are complicated. Urban, you know, it's a primary example, but it's not the only one. And the challenge for technology is not just about range. Now, that's important, but the technology has to help the soldiers understand and act quicker than their adversaries, and it has to work for the soldier. It has to be simple enough to use. So we think the way to win, to win this uh, battle for the speed of understanding, is to fuse sensors and information and displays into an intuitive way that allows a small unit to, to outthink and act quicker than their adversaries. And this is a fundamental change in the way we think about how we empower soldiers in small units in, in my technology area. I believe that the technology of fusing information with the sensors can allow a small unit to act like a bigger one, uh, even if it's operating in a disaggregated, dispersed way. It's not about sending the information upward so much as it's flowing information down to that small unit across echelons and empowering them to act uh, more independently. So this is a blending of traditional DOD technologies that we're all familiar with, sensors, communications, the displays, the networking, uh, but also, it's also a new generation of information technology uh, technologies from the virtual display world, all taken from commercial communities. We've been using the term augmented reality, uh, working on this for about five years now, augmented reality to describe it. We've gotten some very good results. If you came by our booth, you maybe saw that or went over the PEO soldier trailer. Um, I think it's good, you know, seeing it already working its way into programs, to programs, which is tremendous. The commercial world sort of using this same term right now, so maybe we have to do a little deconfliction. But I think the challenge is to blend the old and the new so that the user can we can produce prototypes, the user can experiment, figure out what we really need, and CFT can go out and write those requirements. And as um, both General Donahue and General Gervais said, technology, we really don't want multiple sets of hardware. We want one hardware set that supports everything from the training to the rehearsal to the actual execution of the fight. Uh, we need to drive the hardware and the technology to that end state. The second fundamental change I'd like to talk about is evolving to a fully digital soldier architecture. Uh, General Donahue talked about that. You know, even a few years ago, the soldier was essentially analog. I mean, uh, General Townsend's chart is perfect. And you know, we have an analog image intensifier mobility sensor, an analog thermal weapon site, an analog weapon, analog communications. They're all helping the soldier execute the mission, but they don't talk to each other in any significant way. And we are losing the value of synergy. We're not getting the value of these things working together, the power savings, cost savings, and improvements in capability. So I believe that a standards-based government architecture that would enable these devices to talk together, your future helmet sites, your weapon site, uh, the weapon itself, computer and the communications, this is a fundamental enabler for this transformation. I, I think there's really two big advantages, at least I see two advantages. The one is it's a plug-and-play plug and architecture will allow us to continue to evolve the technology. You know, not every one of these technologies evolves at the same rate. And we think if we can avoid getting locked into like overarching systems, it will allow a more continuous refresh, keep the soldier up to date, and also help keep the cost down. And from, for those of you in industry, I think one advantage, another major advantage is it's a level playing field for you. Uh, you know, it gives you a more fully competitive landscape. If you, if you, if you say, for example, if you're a thermal weapon site provider and, and you, lose, you, lose a, you lose out on a buy, you know, it still gives you the opportunity to make improvements, to work with the labs, improve your product, and get in on the next one and not get locked out. So I think this type of approach, uh, which we're working directly with the CFT and PO soldier on, is gonna give us the benefits of innovation. It's a big win-win for all of us. So I think that's the second fundamental advantage or technology approach we wanna pursue. And I guess I have a minute left, so I just wanna comment briefly on the value of the sci CFT to science and technology. You know, for the, again, my 30 years, this is the first time in a long time I've seen senior leaders 
focus in detail on the problems and focus on how technology can help solve those problems. And uh, as a lab, I really like knowing what the customer's priorities are and having a fully informed customer. Uh, you know, we have a lot of things to do in labs, way more than we have money for. And the CFT is helping us get insight on what are the most likely avenues to be successful. Uh, you know, I personally, I'm sure those of you in the industry, you hate working on things that don't go anywhere. Um, and I think working with the CFT, working with this model is going to help us improve our success over time. Probably won't be perfect. Uh, we'll, you know, need to make some improvements, but I think if we stay on this path, we stay with this focus, uh, the long-term effects will be, will be significant. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, uh, Bruce Hawk, and I want to introduce myself to, for those of you who don't know me, because the last time I sat on a panel, I literally walked into the door and was uh, asked to sit on a congressional panel and I heard a lot of people say who the hell is this guy and I just want you to know that I actually do have some credentials to talk about the Hill. I spent eight years on the professional staff of the Senate Armed Services Committee and I did uh, Army and Marine Corps programs and acquisition policy and some of the things we're living with today I'm sorry are my fault. Uh, it is good, see, it is, uh, good to see uh, soldiers highlighted yet again as, as a priority. It's, they're important, they've always been a priority, but as, as General Townsend highlighted, past initiatives to make soldiers a priority uh, have fizzled out, primarily because, part of it because of funding, but because, but because we've been engaged in uh, war for over 15 years now. And I'm really happy to see that senior army leadership are all on the same page. I haven't seen that in a long time. And articulating soldiers as a priority, and this will resonate with Congress. Regarding soldier lethality, uh, as the CFT moves forward, I was really glad to hear that uh, General Donahue and the Sergeant Major uh, Daly are taking into consideration about what the soldiers carry and lightening the load, because I think that's really important to soldier lethality. And, I'm now going to go a little bit off script, and, and even though it's probably too late in the, in the uh, uh, program, but I'm going to talk about a few observations that I have regarding the CFTs. Uh, I know the Army should be commended for articulating clear priorities and then organizing these CFTs around these priorities. I think transparency and engagement are very important to the CFT process, and it sounds like the, all the leadership uh, is fully engaged, and I hope they maintain that. They need to engage with industry, and they need to engage with Congress in order to maintain the momentum they're trying to gain with this uh, new endeavor. The uh, continuous dialogue helps the Army understand the art of the possible as well. To my uh, industry partners, I need to remind you that uh, transparency is a two-way street. Congress has no problems uh, getting their points across, and industry should maintain open lines of communication and be willing to discuss issues with their Army customer before seeking relief in other forums. And I think you know what I'm talking about. I'm also uh, glad to see that the CFTs get after the accountability issue that Senator McCain especially is, has, has been pounding for years uh, on the Armed Services Committee. It's pretty clear from this week that the CFT leads are in charge, kind of, uh, with their higher authorities, and they understand the, the, that they are accountable for the outputs of their CFTs. I do think that there is uh, too much focus on little a acquisition and a lot of focus on big A, and not enough focus on big A acquisition, and, and I was glad to hear the secretary talk about that on the first day. If you're interested, I could talk a, a bit more about that in the Q&As because I've been involved with that. I was also glad to hear that the Secretary indicated that the Army will use OTAs judiciously. All it takes is one mistake or one overreach and the Hill will be quick to take away the OTA authority that uh, needs to, to hopefully rapidly acquire equipment. Uh, I do think there is a concern on the Hill regarding the use of directed requirements to justify buying off existing SOCOM contracts. Some, st some staff view this as a way of avoiding competition and that's what they get, that's what their interest is, especially on the Hill. It's always been my interest. 
uh, question is, what, at what point will the Hill get involved? Uh, we've already seen the appropriators uh, put language in on uh, competing the, re the uh, remaining requirement for the ground mobility vehicle. I know the Army's intent is to, is to buy out that requirement with a competition, but obviously someone has concerned enough to add legislation to the uh, omnibus appropriation. The one final comment I want to make about is, is about priorities, and I can commend the senior Army leadership for being on the same page, but the real test is in the enduring nature of these priorities. Several times this week I heard the Chief's priorities, the Chief's priorities, and yes, they are the Chief's priorities. We all need to be on the same page with the Chief, but frankly, they're the Army's priorities. And I highlight that because when I was on the Hill, the Navy and the Air Force would come over and they would talk about their priorities. And those priorities didn't change from CNO to CNO or Chief of Staff of the Air Force or Chief of Staff of the Air Force. And I know it's easier for them. They have big platforms. They can focus on, on, on big things. But when the Army went over to the Hill, if there wasn't, it seemed like as soon as the Chief changed, the Army priorities changed. And I think that sends a mixed message. It, it, it really hurts the staff because the staff wants to help the ar Army, but it also confuses the members. So I, I think the Army just needs to be cognizant of that as they, as they bring their message to the Hill, because I think it does erode uh, Army support. Again, uh, I appreciate the invita AUSA's invitation for, for having me sit on this important panel, and I look forward to your questions. Uh, Army strong. Thank you, panel. Uh, we're going to transition to questions now. Major General Gervais, government usually has requirements that describe hardware and software things. Why does the government not ever ask industry about training outcomes? For example, soldier time to proficiency, soldier time to expertise, soldier retention time, soldier readiness and performance uh, throughout and utilization and total cost of ownership. So, so great question. Um, so, as, as we developed our, what I call is the, uh, the, the statement of need for the synthetic training environment, you know, as you read through that, um, there was a lot of things in there that talked about the synthetic training environment. And in those, uh, we listed kind of the, the attributes, the characteristics that we wanted um, as an outcome from the overall STE. And as part of that, you know, we wanted things that, you know, trainability, we wanted training management tools that could get after the training effectiveness piece. We also wanted to make sure that we didn't do what the, the Sergeant Major uh, of the Army highlighted, which was created, you know, were we reinforcing those basic skills? In addition, were we also focusing on how do we make sure that we're also getting better as we're going through? So how, how do you measure that? And so as we kind of have um, kind of brought the STE together, and we're still refining the requirement, and what we've done is we've actually um, increased our collaboration with industry. Every month we have a touch point. In addition, our statement of need, as we were writing it, we sent that out to our industry partners and said, give us feedback, what are we missing? And we did that not just for our overall synthetic training environment, which we released back in um, September of 17, we also did that for our uh, squad soldier virtual trainer, which we just released in February. So what we're doing right now is we are partnering with industry, with academia, and then with us. So we're trying to figure out what is it that we're missing and what do we need to include. And we've gotten some very, very valuable feedback from our industry partners that we've actually put in um, some of these requirements as we're refining them. So from my perspective, as we continue through this process, we will get after those things um, that you've mentioned right here. Now let me hit costs for just a second. Uh, when I took over this job um, 18 months ago and I started going through the process and we started laying out the linear approach and we were going through the typical, you know, Army Requirements Oversight Council and doing all of the um, necessary steps for that. There was a couple things that I saw with cost that concerned me. And w 
I found that because as we developed the Soldier Virtual Collective Trainer, we saw that we could develop that because it was software-centric versus hardware-centric. We relied on commercial uh, virtual and gaming technology. It was a games for training uh, program. What we saw was that cost went down. However, as we were doing our costing models for STI, we were going up. And the reason for that was because our costing models that we have to have historical data for was based on our legacy systems. We didn't have a process or a method that truly allowed us to understand what was happening in the commercial virtual and gaming uh, industry and then normalizing that as we developed our costs for STI. So one of the objectives that I have with my CFT is how do we capture that? And we actually have a my term, a coster, I don't think that's their official term, but the Financial Management Comptroller Office has given me that expertise who sits right there with us and we are refining not just the cost for STI, the model, and how should this be captured in the future for everybody else. So hopefully that answered your question and if anybody would like to jump in, you're more than welcome. The, the thing I'd add very quickly is all those parameters and everything else, uh, you know, people like soldier lethality, but the other, you know, armor side, everybody else, we, we owe that data to General Gervais. That's just not on her to figure that out. That's the cross-cutting nature of all these CFTs and how we're now reaching out to other people as well. I, I'd just like to add that when you talk about data collection and analysis, that does resonate with uh, certain staff members on the Hill, and it really helps get your point across if you have a uh, data informed uh, recommendation or discussion with them. We've got some really good questions. Y'all have been very responsive here and uh, Brigadier General Palmer here is pretty much overrun with white cards right now. So. <laughs> well, well, we'll try to combine them here. We got some that overlap, so, but uh, Sergeant Major, uh, as you've mentioned during your introductory remarks, we can't have want for everything. Is this the time to pursue a new uniform such as pinks, greens, when the investment should be better used for more lethality than for branding aesthetics? Can you explain why this initiative is so important? Uh, the answer to the question is yes. It is, no, um, I'll explain. Um, there, there's never a good time to do these things if you look at it from a resourcing perspective. It, there is a cost associated with everything that we do. Um, General Don, Donahue and I had a very, very detailed destruction, I mean, uh, in discussion about cost. We pay too much for stuff. We do. And w uh, this is part of our inability to maintain pace with our potential adversaries, because they don't pay as much for stuff as we do. And we have to be careful of that. We have to work together as industry, collaborative with the requirements people, to help reduce those costs or it eventually will be unsustainable. The cost for some of the things that we need now, the technology we need to put in soldiers' hands, um, is quite expensive. And that is one of the decisions of why we have to limit it to the number of soldiers. So, so how do you have that discussion simultaneously with the introduction of a new uniform which also costs money? It does. Now some of that cost is inherent in the fact that we have to give a soldier a uniform. So some of that is assumed. And we're working very hard to get that cost to be neutral. Unfortunately, the reality of that is it's, it won't be, okay, because for several reasons, though. Uh, we went to one uniform as an army. We're the only service, I believe, that only has one. So we put ourselves in a very cheap cost bracket with regards to uniforms in the army. So it's hard to stay in that bracket. Um, it really is. And then the material we use to produce those uniforms and the, and the desired material of the new uniform is superior. It's, it's a much higher quality uniform. Um, but there's, there's, a, there's a bigger value to this than I think that is the risk assumed with the financial cost, and that is um, the image of the American soldier. And I truly believe this. I truly believe this. This is, this is our core uniform that we began with back in 1775, the blues. That would remain the same. Um, but we have to uh, change the image of the American soldier in the American public's eye. And I think that the pinks and greens would do that. This is the last uniform that as a nation we came to collective, collectively together. Um, out of need that people still gravitate to. Doesn't a week go by that I don't get a letter from the greater American public that says, Sergeant Major, if you do anything, make this happen. We have to make soldiers look like soldiers um, to the American public, and public support is a big part of what we do. You can war game the cost of it all day long, um, and you can 
weigh the outcomes of the risk of buying this uniform against its you know, monetary value. I believe the risks and the benefits exceed that. Thank you. General Donahue, are there any inconsistencies or tensions between the soldier lethality CFT efforts and the OSD close combat lethality task force? What changes, if any, would you make to these charters uh, of either the soldier lethality or the uh, close combat task force to enhance the outcomes? I would tell you no, there's absolutely none. And in fact, the close combat task force director, as I mentioned, He's here, he just spent the last two days with us. Um, and I would tell you, as you look at the prioritization here of what we have, um, Next Generation Squad Weapon, OSD Close Combat Task Force, and then our other initiative here to get out to the force this fall, ENVGB, uh, Close Combat Task Force has paid for the bulk of, of what we're trying to do with that, with the Army obviously helping out as well. So there is great synergy there, and I would tell you our vision is their vision. Mr. Rego and uh, General Donahue, I'm going to sort of combine things because it goes with uh, night vision and sensor integration, but uh, hopefully this will cover both with one question. What of the things you spoke about yesterday at the Warriors Corner was fusing information from the battlefield sensors? How integrated are you with the night, uh, night vision CFT or NGV CV CFT to help ensure interoperability between the armored teams and the dismounted soldiers as far as technology goes? Um, so the first one is, is coincidentally, uh, Breeder General Dave L'Esperance works about 75 meters from my office, so I would tell you we're very well integrated. What he's developing, soldier lethality, is very interested in because that's, too, that's a mutually supporting platform. He actually, when I talk about heads-up display 3.0, and that vendor that we're working with, he actually went through and saw all that, and, and we are simpatico on the way ahead of what that, uh, or what that shared vision is with that. And I just want to reinforce something. That shared vision is, is that we'll have that first prototype in 18 months. And we think potentially we could pull that to the left. Um, so we're, we're, we're moving very quickly on that, and um, we are confident that. Now, for the first version, ENVG 1.0, we have right now, just to show you how we're working across the CFTs, that end user device that uh, Major General Pete Gallagher talked about, we are taking data from that and we're already putting that up into the reticle of that capability that we'll get out to the soldiers in October or November of this year. By the way, uh, with this CFT process, we got that requirement approved in five weeks. That got approved, five weeks. Well, if, if the budget would have gotten passed, we could have gotten that capability out to the force actually sooner than October or November. So all this technology, it's all stair-stepping. Whenever we say that we want to build stuff that continues to, to migrate and get better, that's already being done right now. So, sir. And, sir, I'd like to add that um, in our science and technology program, we have, uh, we have efforts ongoing to, to look at how to, to move this information and fuse it across uh, between mounted and dismounted. You know, we understand the Army fights as combined arms, and so a big effort in our science and technology program is to work that, uh, work that integration between the ground, uh, the mounted and dismounted, and future robotic environments so that information can be shared uh, across the force. So it's definitely a big part of our, um, the way we're going forward. Sergeant Major Daly um, and or General Donahue, the link between material solutions and training to enhance capability has been well made given the planned increase to OSET time. How has the Army mapped the totality of skill sets, weapons, uh, accelerators, nods, radios, and practical application to the training model in the standard expected on joining their first unit? Uh, so the first thing is obviously with OSIT extension, we're running the pilot of that in July. So I just want to make sure that's a pilot. So we'll make sure that whatever comes out the other end, we're working very closely with obviously uh, TRADOC, General Townsend, his, uh, you know, this is a, a priority for him and we've discussed this often now. But um, <clears throat> what we want is, is out of the OSIT extension is we want to make sure that a soldier, when they come out of that, they can enter into the sustained readiness model at any point. So we want to increase their physical and mental toughness, and we want to increase their capability. So they will come out more qualified across the board on all the soldier skills and also be better prepared um, to, when they first enter that unit, to perform 
and also we think that'll help with them fulfilling their first requir requirement in the Army, that first enlistment, and then also staying longer. And, and I agree, and uh, the trade-out commander and I were having a discussion. We've, we've known the need to lengthen basic training for some time, and we've got, uh, we have an increased capability um, for our soldiers, and uh, we've got to take them to that level of the requirement that units expect them to show up firsthand. Um, from a material perspective, though, I've, I've recently had this discussion with some of our material developers, and I think that we can get after this, and it's about changing the requirements. Um, they were showing me a new piece of equipment. I'll refrain from what that piece of equipment was, and they told me that each end, uh, end user was going to require an 80-hour training block in order for them to become the basic user, and then the more advanced users were going to have to have more and more training. And I said, to, ladies and gentlemen, do you have your iPhones? Yeah. Can you pull them out? Yeah. All right. Where's the instruction manual? There are none. You know why? Because you wouldn't buy it if there was. But it has a lot of capability. It does a lot. And we got to start designing equipment. So you know, we spend a lot of time and money training soldiers for every specific capability task. But we got to build a requirement in this that's inherent and user ability is part of the, the requirement. Because um, we don't do that. I mean, our radios are very complex systems. They don't need to be, at least I don't think they need to be that complex. Um, and we have to make it user friendly for soldiers to be able to use. And there should be an, an 80 hour training contract that goes along with every piece of equipment that we issued soldiers. Um, we have to build those into the requirements. We've got to make things less complex and more capable. More capable doesn't mean we need to add complexity to the end user. And, and to that point, actually, everything that we're developing, it has to be more simple, not more complicated. And I would tell you, the vast majority of things across the CFTs, especially if you look at General Gallagher's D and this one, they are considerably uh, more simple to that, to making sure we're doing that linkage. I'll make a comment about the training part of the question. So. Um, We've, as the Sergeant Major said, Army senior leadership for some time has had a desire to lengthen uh, and, and make more challenging our initial entry training. Two kind of efforts there. Uh, one is with basic combat training. Uh, we just finished a pilot at Fort Jackson. Uh, that The results of that uh, are, are, have been approved. Fort Jackson is moving out and pretty by this fall we should export to the other three places where we do basic combat training. Uh, maximizing the, the time that we have, currently 10 weeks. So there was a desire to, to extend it, but two things kind of mitigate against that. One, it's kind of hard to do that when you're growing the Army at the same time. Uh, so we also realized that we could probably maybe look at the, the time we have available and maximize that. So we're doing that. And uh, I just went down and looked at that uh, a week ago and was really impressed with, with what we're doing down there. Uh, then on the o infantry OSIT, uh, we're piloting an extension of infantry OSIT. Pro probably a lot of people don't know this, but infantry one station unit training, essentially basic training and AIT combined into one continuous course, is one of the shortest uh, initial entry training sequences we have in our Army. And uh, we just need to, uh, we definitely need to extend that. We're going to figure out, we're going to pilot a course to figure out how much bang we can get for the buck and still keep manning our, our growing, still growing army. And, and the funding for that is coming out of, uh, we're, we're confident, of phase two of Secretary Mattis's close combat uh, task force. Mr. Hogg, one of the principles of the CFT is to engage the uh, industry. True to the word, the CFT leads uh, have walked the floor and have been are open to discussion. Do you have any thoughts on regarding CFT engagement of industry. I uh, oh, thank you for the question. <laughs> the uh, uh, I, I think the Army, when they engage industry and the Hill, for that matter, is to uh, be consistent with their messaging. Uh, I I think I say that because I think uh, the, the Army expects industry rightfully to invest in now prototypes to help identify requirements, and, and that's great. But there are other programs of record that the Army uh, needs to talk about and be consistent with their message. Uh, I use, I, I like to use uh, MPF as the example because this week I learned that the next generation combat vehicles 
FUE, whatever, however that's defined, is going to be moved to the left to 2023. Great. I think, I think that's something that needs to be done. But at the same time, they're going to be fielding uh, mobile protective fire in 2024. And that kind of, you know, industry I know has spent a lot of money on, on MPF and they're afraid. I heard some, some folks on the floor talk about the Army walking away from MPF and I don't think they're going to do that. But I think that the message needs to be consistent of why, you, why moving NGCV to the left at the same time that you're going to field uh, MPF and at the same time that creates a little bit of confusion in Congress and my appropriation friends will say, well, why do you need two vehicles at the same time? And I know this is, is new information, but I hope the Army gets up to the hill quickly to explain that they need both, that one is for a current requirement and another is to help inform the future requirement. Uh, since we're talking about that, and it has to do with uh, consistent messaging, I think JLTV is a great model, and I'm sorry that I'm talking equipment at soldier lethality, but I think, I think the model applies. And, and why was JLTV, I think, a successful program was because of senior leader involvement, like we have now. Uh, the vice and the ACMAT got personally involved in approving and, and, and reducing the requirements so that they could go faster and afford JLTV. The PEO did a great job of, of working with the Army uh, leadership to coll uh, collaborated with all the important elements and to ensure that the uh, KPPs were modified again to get the program under cost and on, on schedule and I think that's what they've done. But the key is that the Army after they awarded th uh, three at EMD, they didn't close out industry, and I, the current version of JLTV was, is being delivered by a company who was not in the EMD phase. And why was that? Because the Army put out the message that they were going to look at all, all players, industry, one company invested in their version of JLTV, and it proved to be the, the best model that the Army could do. So I think it's just, just if the Army is going to expect industry to invest, they need to have a consistent message that they're going to follow up with that investment. And I'm going to add a comment, given uh, probably the industry guy in the, the panel as well as Ben, uh, the guy involved with writing requirements. What one, one thing I learned in the transition to industry, we tend to, we in the government side tend to treat industry as it's industries the same. And, and they aren't. I mean, small businesses are different between commercial, government, they all have different values, they all have different cultures, they all have different reasons to be motivated by it. And, and I would argue as we look at the requirements and everything else and as you gauge industry, understand the culture of the industry that you want to solve your problem so that you can motivate that cultural group to solve your problem because if you don't, you, you can throw words at them but you're not communicating with them or more importantly energizing them to help with that solution. So just the uh, experience piece there. Uh, Sergeant Major Daly, the Secretary of the Army said that we are planning to implement a new physical fitness program. Can you provide any details on this and will it include mental and spiritual fitness? Uh, no, actually I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask the trade off commander to help me because he's working this as well too and we had a discussion about it just a few minutes, uh, not linked to this panel, but uh, some upcoming meetings we have with the Chief and Secretary. We, we have been working this for some time. Um, this is, a, this is a tough task. It sounds like, eh, why haven't they got a PT test out yet? It's not that easy. I mean, so there's a lot of science that goes behind this um, with regards to, first you've got to answer the question is, what do you want to test? What do you want to gauge? That, that what you test becomes important. That what you grade becomes important. Um, right now we test general fitness. So people bash the PT test, but it does a pretty darn good job of what it's designed to do. It's designed to gauge a general level of fitness under the requirements given to us by the DODI and the limitations we gave to the designers. It can be done anywhere, by anyone, in any location, with no equipment. Works pretty darn good. Does it, does it meet the requirements to identify whether every soldier um, can do the multitude of 150 MOS tasks that we have across the Army? No. It wasn't designed to do that. So, but we have to get better at this. We have to get better at being able to say, can, does our physical fitness requirements match the capabilities and needs of what we need a soldier to do on the battlefield. 
And that's what I'll shift to the trade out commander because then working with Forcecom, they have the lead for this, sir. Thanks, Sergeant Major. Uh, so um, I don't want to get in front of Army senior leadership and their decision space, but sort of here's where we are in that. Just like the Sergeant Major said, uh, you know, people are wanting to measure something that our current APFT is not designed to measure. Uh, more functional fitness, more fitness for combat readiness in our current APFT by our own studies has about uh, maybe 30 at best 40 percent correlation to combat uh, battlefield fitness. So we have uh, designed a test uh, that we've been piloting and studying and getting gaining that on uh, an Ar army combat readiness test that we think will have a much higher correlation to battlefield fitness requirements. Uh, where we are in that, it's probably going to, in the next year, we'll probably pilot that on a larger scale. It's been a fairly small scale uh, effort right now, sort of a parallel effort between uh, Forces Command and TRADOC. We're going to bring those efforts together. And uh, there'll be, I think, Army leadership decisions here in the next few months. Uh, and we'll probably see a, a large scale pilot of that. Probably still do uh, both uh, PT test, tests. The current APFT will remain during this pilot, our, our test of record while we uh, large-scale pilot um, this new ACRT, and then we'll see where it goes from there. But uh, we've got pretty good science on the tasks that need to be done, and um, I think we'll, we'll get there. Yeah. Uh, Major General Dravet, the Chief of Staff of uh, the Army says, readiness is our number one mission. A new business concept is event-based rentals, training as a service. There are companies that have immediate solutions available today. Is anyone willing to challenge the status quo and rent an 80% solution from industry partners uh, that are able to provide it today? Yeah, so, you know, as, as we're going through this entire process, um, and you kind of have to kind of remember where we are in the process. You know, we are, and each CFT is kind of different, and we're all at different stages. STI is right at the very beginning. It is pre-milestone decision um, authority piece. So I'm in the very beginning of defining that requirement. And so what I've kind of laid out to industry, and I've shown them, is that you know we are going to have constant engagement with industry. We are going to put out what we're going to kind of tell you what we're trying to achieve. We're not going to tell you how to do it. And that's a little bit different because we want you to be very, very innovative with how you come back to us. And then from that, you know, we're, we are going to test, we're going to experiment, we're going to demonstrate, we're going to prove what is the best solution. And then once we go through these users' uh, assessments and we see what is there and what works, what doesn't work, then we will go into our senior leaders with a better informed decision into whether we go into the acquisition process as training as a service, whether we can go straight into a milestone C, whether we have to go through the entire a traditional FAR-based um, approach. But this process that we're doing right now is helping us understand that and will help us provide that opportunity to um, inform our senior leaders. And we've actually seen training as a service. It's already being used in other places. So we kind of know the effectiveness. We have to gauge, is it going to do what we need it to do for the synthetic training environment? Can it scale? And is it the most cost effective? So we are actually looking at all of those. But I will say this again. We have not taken anything off the table as a potential solution to deliver in the STI. And we see some things that potentially could be better delivered as potentially a service where other things may not. General Donahue, I'm going to combine a couple questions here. After solving near-term challenges gaps, where do you see robotics automation systems fitting within the soldier lethality cross-functional team and the close fight for enhancing SA and lethality? Along with that, do we have uh, some kind of powered armored suits in the future as in Starship Trooper? Um, so I'll start with the first portion. Yes, robotics and UAS are both going to be very important to the squad, platoon, and company. Um, and we mentioned that that was uh, once we get through these initial CFT capabilities, they will be the ones that will come next. Um, so extremely important. And I would tell you, we are doing a lot of, uh, you know, testing and bringing in different capabilities with that um, right now with, with both of those. Um, it, in fact, um, 
the Maneuver Center of Excellence, not a CFT capability, but they just announced the other day about uh, some of the robotic capability that is going to be tested in our brigade combat teams here in the next uh, few months. So that, that I would argue that's here now. It's just a matter of figuring out how we're going to pay for it and what capability we want. Now, as far as exoskeleton goes, um, we're, we're pretty far away from exoskeleton. However, people are doing a lot of pretty neat things. I would tell you, I think exoskeleton will probably go to uh, our mechanics and people like that first and help them with what they're doing out. As we talk about fighting uh, semi-independent, remote, all these other things, that's where he's going to help out first. Yeah, and I'll add, having worked that, that program actually, we need a power solution before we can get to the exoskeleton. So if you got a, a really good power solution besides a small nuke, let us know. Um, <clears throat> how can the Army industry, and this is for the whole panel, how can the Army and industry develop better capabilities, develop capabilities that emphasize the soldier as a platform similar to the way it treats vehicles and airframes? Um, yeah, I have a great example that we're doing with TARDEC. Um, we used to not put soldiers in the requirements process, but what we do now is we bring soldiers up there with architectural designers, and before we even think about putting pen to paper from an architectural or an engineering perspective, we listen to what they need and what they, what they think they need on the battlefield. And after 15, 17, 18 years of war, what is it that will enable you? We can, we can, there's a lot of stuff to buy, um, but um, there's limited resources to buy it, and we've got to get down to what the capability gaps. And sometimes I always say, if you, want, if you want to know what the best weapon is, go to one of our soldiers that shoots 30,000 rounds every six months. They probably could tell, probably have a good indication of what, what a good weapon is. Um, these young men and women do not have the capability to build the next aircraft or uh, machine, but they darn sure can tell you whether or not um, the idea you have is going to work or if they need it or if they can employ it. I think that's one of the key things, and we've seen success with that already. If you go up on the wall um, up at Tardec and see some of the things that the architectural designers have come up along with the soldiers, um, many of those I believe you'll see will turn into material solutions in the future. Yeah, I would add just um, echo what Sergeant Major said and just you know, co collaborate on prototyping. That's, that would be my main message is you know, use your innovation, collaborate with us, make prototypes, and then experiment with the soldiers. You know, we have a long history of experimenting to, to figure out what needs to be done. And then once we've done that prototyping experimentation, uh, you know, that's, that's helped stimulate the requirements process to Im embed these innovations. And we have lots of examples of where that's worked. And so we are uh, definitely open to industrial involvement in that. Uh, use your IR&D, work with us, work with the labs, and uh, it can make a big difference. Yeah, and so just from the synthetic training environment perspective, um, so as, as we kind of worked our way through releasing our statement of need and request for white papers and kind of asking for all of that feedback from our um, industry partners, what we found as we did our user assessment, because, you know, we had the soldiers and the actual users, you know, the, the Bradley Master Gunners, the pilots, we had National Guard um, uh, soldiers that were there that could help us understand, you know, the uh, some of the challenges of providing capability out to, you know, distributed and uh, less infrastructure. But we also had, as I stated up front, we had our simulations, our technical experts with our industry partners. So not only were they evaluating the, the platform from the user's perspective on what they needed, but then we were able to look under the hood from the actual simulation, the whole coding piece of it, and then we provided that feedback to our industry partner. And so what they have now is the opportunity to go back over the next um, 30 to 60 days and we're staying imbe embedded with them as they're developing this and we're helping them. It's kind of like developmental ops the whole way. And so we're going to help them all through the summer and then we're going to put it in the hands of that, you know, that leader and the soldiers. And I think if we do more of that, then we really can really refine the requirement and the need. And, you know, the best thing, and I don't ever want to have to have that conversation you had with me one week in the job. But you know, they'll see the value in it. The soldier will see the value in it as they're coming. And the best measure of success is when the soldier sees the value in it and that leader, and they use it. So you know, we can put all kind of metrics in place, but I think that's the ultimate metric right there, and it helps them do what they need to do. The uh, adaptive soldier architecture, that was the very first thing we established back in uh, November. 
whenever we stood this thing up, before we went into any sort of material thing or anything else. And we gave them a, a bunch of things to solve. There's four of them, I'm not gonna bore you with it. But just up at Fort Belvoir, uh, General Potts and Dr. Riego and his team hosted it. We had people in there from industry, we had uh, soldiers, E6s, from you know squad leaders, to all the people who are a part of the process. They all sat in a room for three days and they did nothing but solve four questions for us that we know are extremely important. So all that interface stuff and everything that we were talking about, they were in there to solve that problem, uh, figure out what the metrics are of a squad, and then power. So power actually became a CFT priority because we realized how important it was to this overarching thing. But everybody was right there. And then for ENVGB, you spin right back out. We've already had three of six soldier touch points. Industry's there. The right soldiers are there, specifically a bunch of squad leaders from uh, 25th ID, 82nd Airborne Division uh, for that one. Um, and they're giving immediate feedback of what should be on that, that prototype so that whenever we do uh, get that out to the force in October, that final version will have the right stuff in it. And I'll go, I'm sorry, sir, did you want to say anything? I'll go ahead and add, having been, as, as General Townsend's indicated, there's been multiple iterations of Soldier as a System, and I was heavily involved with one. And one challenge, and I'll throw to Mr. Hawk, is the Congress did not understand what we were saying when we said Soldier as a System. They understood a tank, they understood a plane, they did not understand all this stuff we're trying to put on a soldier, and it was hard for them to wrap around, uh, and, and this was the communication back from Congress, was to wrap around, what are you talking about here? Uh, you know, you're talking a rifle here. They, they didn't understand all the components that go into it. So I don't know if you have a perspective on that, but that was a huge challenge. Uh, OSD was a participant in that confusion. So, and so I'll just tell you on that one real quick is, um, and I think Mr. Hickey's still out there, so the, we've had literally dozens of uh, engagements with different congressional, you know, in, on what we're trying to do. And uh, there are no metrics, just like you said. The picture we always put up is, we can tell you what happens if you add something to an aircraft carrier, an M1 tank, or an F-35. If you do something to a squad, what happens? So we have to develop those metrics. That's part of what we're trying to develop. I, I, and he took us to task on, well, what does that do? So we have to be able to answer that. It's our, our number one problem we're trying to solve. Yeah. I, I think that, uh, I'm how to say this without sounding defensive, but at the end of the day, it, it, the communications involved, or, or the way the Army described what had to be done, I'm sorry to say, was in Army speak. And I, I, I know Jim Hickey, I know John Watson, Doug Bush, these guys get it. Yeah. But you're talking to other people who don't. And when you engage the Hill, you need to speak English. And keep in mind, that I don't want you to insult the professional staff, but there are people who don't get it. And if you give it to them in English, it helps them explain it to their bosses because that's really what you want to do. And that's kind of what I, I, I can recall several times, even industry does the same thing. Just don't give me the buzzwords, just explain it to me in plain speak because it helps me translate it to the member. And that's kind of how, how some things fail. Just, that's a great point. You know, and, uh, and if we're going over the hill, we shouldn't have acronyms. There shouldn't be an acronym on a slide. Plain English is a is, uh, you know, the sort of the universal language, and sometimes I think we're our own, our own worst enemy. Not to beat it to death, uh, I just do want to point out, I think it was General Jouvet who said it, and I can't overemphasize, and that is, especially with the CFTs and the prototyping and, and all these, hopefully, industry engagements you have with them, you need to make sure you give industry feedback. Because, uh, okay, I, I, I've, I've personally have seen where, uh, Okay, I've had clients who've responded to BAAs and the Army refuses to give them a copy of, of what they tested. And the clients want that information so that they can make improvements so, for the next iteration. So I just, just feedback to industry is important and we just shouldn't close, close that off. 
Yeah, no, uh, you bring up a, uh, an excellent point. In fact, um, as we've been going through these industry engagements um, and we've been getting the feedback, we have actually adjusted based on what industry has given us. And so as we went through this first um, user assessment and we went from like 40 down to the seven vendors, um, so those that asked for the, the feedback that weren't selected, um, we, we talked to them. They also got the feedback right there in real time um, as they were being talked to. But I'm also setting up an AAR to go to the after action review of the whole process. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm trying to put it in plain speak. Um, I'm going to the seven <clears throat> vendors. Because, you know, and then what's interesting now, as we went through the first one and we're getting ready to go through the second as the soldiers uh, squad virtual trainer, as we went through that process, industry gave us feedback and said, hey, we want a little more specifics on when we come into the user assessment, what we're going to put in there. So we have given that in the next one. And so we're kind of, I call it kind of, you know, we're learning. We've only been up for 175 days. So we're kind of, you know, I think it, the words were prototyping the process. So we're learning as we go, and our industry and our academia partners are helping us along the way. So great point. And, and share with them too. Hey, this is this is really what, to your point, what we want. But all this other stuff, we're willing to talk about trading it. That, that's another very important thing that I think we've got to yep. do a better job of. General Donahue, the AMD CFT is only addressing uh, class three and above threats. Class one and two drones will be dr addressed primarily through CAFAD. What programs or training is addressing this emerging and growing threat? Is there any liaison with RDC RAM? So um, the RCFT soldier lethality, we're, we are not dealing with that just because um, Major General Brito in the, major, in the Maneuver Center of Excellence, they are addressing that um, specifically with the capabilities that they're looking at and they're, they're, they're doing some very good things with that as well as, you know, we're already, this isn't so much for what the soldier's carrying, um, but uh, we are already putting out capability out to Europe, and we've started training soldiers, and um, uh, I think uh, General McIntyre's in here, but he's already training, uh, the 173rd and 2CR have received training of, of carrying a Stinger missile. So that's immediate fix, and then there's uh, materiel solutions and training that are coming out there pretty sh short order. Yeah, I'll, I'll add. I probably have as much experience with enemy drones as anybody in the room. Um, that, uh, like uh, CD said, uh, although the efforts of the CFT may be focused on the higher end drone threat and aircraft threat uh, to our maneuver forces, uh, there is there is a robust OSD and Army program for addressing the smaller scale UAV or drone threat, and um, I think that th that's ongoing and we'll seal, see those systems being fielded. We're going to have to stay on top of that because it's not just the lower end adversaries like ISIS that will use these small scale drones. Uh, the Russian new generation warfare study showed that uh, in Ukraine, Russian forces and Russian supported forces used a proliferation of drones from, from commercial off the shelf, low end to very high end uh, drones. We're going to have to address that whole Spectrum. Uh, last question. High tech manufacturing has in increasingly moved overseas. Some of the important strategically laser semiconductors while buying lower cost items is important. So, as supporting U.S. manufacturing uh, capabilities, is the, is the government uh, dealing with this situation? I guess that one's on me. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, I yeah, we try our best to nurture and um, uh, sustain a, a competitive industrial base inside the United States. Uh, you, can't, you can't win every one, and so, so you see some technologies coming in from foreign sources. Uh, but in general, we work, we work manufacturing technology, we work with uh, um, uh, DOD programs, uh, industrial base programs to try to maintain industrial base. Uh, but uh, it's difficult for every single thing to, uh, to maintain a, a, a source of supply. And in some areas, we're working hybrid approaches where some of the key technology is preserved, 
uh, inside the United States, and some of the more general purpose uh, electronics can be procured overseas. I, I, don't, I don't know there's any perfect solution here that, you know, that's within the Army's uh, purview to address, but uh, we definitely do our part to maintain and uh, sustain an industrial base inside the United States, but it's not perfect. What, what I'll add is, uh, if, if those are familiar with slide chain management, there is, uh, I think it's acquisition law, but there is a requirement for all industries producing government programs to have a, an alternate plan in case of supply chain disruption. And I used the tsunami in uh, Japan where our chips were dis for programs that were disrupted and you have to do it. So there is a, there is a legal requirement for every industry owning a government program uh, to, to have an alternative source that meets the criteria. And I'm not going to address the threats of some of this stuff coming in. That's a different topic area. But uh, I, I throw that out to us because you need to understand also when you go to smaller companies, they may not even know that requirement exists. So that's a piece just for consideration. So I'd like to thank the panel. And sir, would you like to make some closing remarks? I will. Uh, but before I close out, I'll, make, I'll, I'll give one final answer to one final question here because I liked it. Uh, so there's a there's a chaplain in the room who wants to know if we're working to uh, improve our small arms ammunition and which calibers we're looking at. So, uh, chaplain, wherever you are out there, uh, we are working on looking at, we're looking at all those things with improving our uh, small arms systems. <laughs> and uh, we are looking at some of the new munitions that you referenced, but I do appreciate that. Uh, apparently the chaplain is a shooter and I like that. <laughs> Um, M4 in one hand and good book in the other. Um, I, I'll close out with this. Uh, I want to thank the panel members here for coming together and, and doing the last panel here, the soldier lethality. It may be uh, last in the sequence, but it's certainly not last in priority. Uh, this is very important for our soldiers, and we spend billions of dollars on major platforms, and we can significantly improve the plight and the future of those troopers on that slide that you see right there on the screen in front of you by spending a few million dollars on them. And uh, so I really think that it's time that we get that right and provide overmatch to our close combat 100,000 soldiers and their squads and platoons. And then we got to stay on task, uh, stay the course and not let ourselves get distracted from this very important goal. Thanks. Thank the panel. Okay, what a great way to wrap up, I think. You know, as we, the, the thought that kept running through my mind is, you know, Abram's old statement that soldiers are the Army, and this panel, I think, exemplifies that. So General Townsend, uh, General Palmer, SMA, and the rest of the panel, thanks very, very much. One, one note about the close combat lethality task force that General Donahue talked about on 11 April. We're very pleased that OSD will do the public rollout of the Close Combat Lethality Task Force at the AUSA headquarters in Arlington, Virginia on, uh, on 11 April. Uh, one other reminder before we all break contact, I would ask you to remember that tomorrow uh, uh, is uh, National Vietnam War Veterans Day. And so take that opportunity to fly your flag proudly, uh, find those Vietnam veterans that you know, and maybe some that you don't know, and thank them. Uh, for all that they have done for our country, it's a, it's a big, big deal. Again, uh, you happy few who stayed to the very end, thank you very much. I hope you found this was useful. We'll see you back here in Huntsville, 26 through 28 March 2019. Safe travels home. Thank you. <laughs>